So this is the uh, this is the second lecture now we're going to do on on query optimizers. So last class we spent our time talking about the history of query optimizers and we sort of started getting into cascades, but we ran out of time. So we're going to we're spend uh, we'll focus um, most of our time on today on that part. Um, before we get into the material, uh, we have two lectures coming up. Uh, so we have one today immediately after the class. If Kratos Pandas. I'm way off. His PhD, he graduated here from CMU in like 2010. He, I started grad school in 2007, and he, he and I overlapped. So I have no idea why I said he, he graduated in 2007. So, but, but he's CMU alum. He did his PhD here with Natasha Alamaki, who used to teach 721 before she left to go to uh, Switzerland. And so he is a, uh, he's an engineer working on Amazon Redshift. That's their cloud system based on Parkcell, which is based on Postgres. Um, so they're going to talk about he's going to talk about some of the stuff that they're they're building there, um, and then next week we're going to have actually two talks from the Hana guys. So Neil will be coming down from Waterloo because SAP bought Sybase and Sybase had a big office in Waterloo uh, in Canada. So he's coming down to give a guest lecture in class, and then he'll be giving another tech talk, a more researchy tech talk on Thursday. So Wednesday we'll, we'll, he'll be in class, and then uh, Thursday will be a separate thing at twelve o'clock um, over in the CIC. So again, I, I encourage you to come come to both of these. And the great thing about coming to these talks is like, I feel like I tell you guys, oh, this is how real systems do this, or these are the things you got to worry about. And then these guys come and sort of validate things I say. So it make, makes me feel like I'm not <laughs> I'm actually telling you useful things. Okay. All right. So as I said, today is the focus that we're going to spend most of our time beginning talking about Cascades or Columbia, which was again the paper you guys read last class, but we didn't get. Uh, spend enough time to get into it. And then we'll briefly talk about the, the plan enumeration problem, which is what the paper you guys read about was, was trying to solve in the, um, fr from, from, from the Germans. And then we'll finish off talking about some other uh, implementations of query optimizers that are out there. Okay? All right, so just to refresh where we were from, from last class, uh, I laid out sort of five different ways to actually implement uh, 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 the, the search optimization strategy in a query optimizer. So we saw the first approach was just using heuristics, which is just doing the rewrite rules without a cost model. Like I know that I always want to push down my predicates and my limits, so I try to, I, I can write rules to do that. Then we talked about how to do a uh, heuristic plus cost-based search from IBM System R, where you do the same re uh, rewriting in the first stage, the first choice, but then you do a uh, search to figure out the, the, the best join order for your you know, for your particular query. And in the system R approach, we looked how to do this using uh, a bottom-up model, a bottom-up search using dynamic programming. Then we sort of saw an oddball system, uh, or not, or not an, a, a slightly different way of doing the, the, the joint ordering search by using a randomized algorithm where you sort of like, every so often you just permute the, the query plan and you jump to a new, uh, new space in the solution and see whether that generates a better plan for you. But the one, the, the last two approaches that, we, that are sort of more relevant to us today in modern systems are the stratified search and unified search. Stratified search is essentially the heuristics plus cost-based search, but you have uh, declarative rules to define what these transformations are actually going to be. Whereas in this approach here, it's just you're writing you know, if statements, if then else statements to, to apply the changes. And then the unified search is the cascades model you guys read about. Um, where you sort of have the transformation from a logical to logical, logical, physical operators in your query plan all done within a single search model. You don't have separate stages. So the, where this Cascades work and the Starburst work came out of was, was in the late 1980s, early 1990s, was this movement towards these optimizer generators. So rather than you implementing in C or C++ or Java, the rules to do the, the, how to transform your queries to optimize them, you instead would write something in a higher level language, like a DSL, to say, here's the transformations or optimizations I can do. You then feed that into a compilation engine, which then crunches on it and then spits out the C++ code or the Java code that will do those transformations. And again, the idea here is that it's easier for humans to reason about how to do these algebraic transformations in our, in our query plans at, in a higher level language rather than in something like low level like C or C++, right? So the, again, the examples were these were Starburst, Exodus, Volcano, and Cascades, and then Op++ we'll talk a little bit about later on from, from Wisconsin. So 
I don't know whether this is this is how uh, com all commercial systems do this, right? Certainly in our Cascades implementation, we don't actually rely on an optimizer generator, right? We we just bake the rules and transformations directly in C++. Um, so Starburst is is using IBM, so I know they're doing this, but I, I don't know about Oracle and I don't know about uh, about SQL Server. So the again, the, there's sort of two classes of algorithms we, we could use. Uh, in our optimizer, there's a stratified versus unified, and again, in the stratified, as we already said, it's just you have a rewrite phase or do the logical to logical transformations, and then when you want to actually do transformation from a logical to physical plan, again, logical would be like join table A and B, physical plan would be join table A and B with a hash join algorithm. So you do the logical logical in the, in the first step, and then the second stage, the second step would be doing the the, the cost-based search to find the logical to physical. And this is primarily being spent on doing join ordering. The one we care about, again, in this in this lecture is the unified search, where again we have all our transformation rules uh, sort of uniformly put into a single search model. Uh, and then we can define priorities of how we want to do our transformations, but then we don't have these separate stages, everything just sort of all at once. Now the tricky thing about this is, which we'll talk about a little bit more next class, is since this is still cost -based, a cost-based search, right? I need to be able to, wait to determine whether a logical plan is still better than, uh, whether one logical plan is better than another logical plan, even though I don't have a, you know, the actual physical plan or physical operators to, that, that my cost model actually would need. So this, is, this gets into the area of the cascade stuff I don't fully understand of how can you actually still do cost model estimations for logical query plans, even though you don't know how you're actually going to read the table or, or how, how you're actually going to do the join. Um, and you may think, all right, well, maybe I'll just take the, the you know, if, if, if I have to read a table, I'll just assume I'll do a sequential scan. And the problem with that is, like, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, how do you actually determine whether, you know, the, the sequential scan is going to be better than index scan without actually having to know whether you're doing index scan or not. So this, this is the stuff I don't fully understand about the, the cascades of the stuff. Right, about how, how all of this sits together. And then it'll make more sense in a second, and we'll see this in, in, in the next, next lecture. Um, so since we're doing a lot more transformations in this approach than in the stratified search, right? stratified is just going from logical to logical. Here we're doing logical to logical and logical to physical. So we could get stuck in an infinite loop, which we'll see in our example in a few more slides. So to avoid having this, this you know, transforming the, the query plan one way and then putting back the other play and go, Weather way and go back and forth, they're going to make heavy use of a memoization table or memo table to keep track of what transformations they've already applied, keep track of what the cost of that transformation was, and they can do that to avoid having to do redundant computations. And this, again, this avoids us getting, this cuts down our number of transformations we have to do. So the other main difference, too, is the difference between top down versus bottom up. So Cascades is an example of a top down approach. And this is where you start with what you want the outcome to be. I want to join table A, A, B, and C. And then you traverse down into the query plan, and then you start transforming those, you know, those, those constructs of the higher level expression you have. I want to join A, B, A, B, and C. To now say how you're going to join A and B, or how you're going to join A and C. And sort of start building the query plan by, by going down, filling in the, filling in the miss, missing pieces. The bottom up optimization is where you start with nothing, and you start incrementally adding in the the elements of your query plan, and you and you start marching towards your goal, and you figure out what path was the had the lowest cost to get you to that goal. So, again, the, the, we'll talk about that later on. But like the, I'm confused. Actually, I don't know which one is actually better. I like the cascades top down approach because I, as a human, I can reason about that. One set of Germans say this approach is better. Don't do this. And then another set of Germans says this which is better now. And then the one set of German that said this was better actually now says this is better. So I, I don't know. OK. And then another set of Germans said this was better. The guy that invented this one said this one's better. So I, I don't know. I'm sorry. OK. This is research. This is OK. All right. Let's get into Cascades. So again, Cascades was invented by Gertz Graffy. The, and he had two other optimizers projects before this. He had Volcano, and before that was Exodus. Um, so the way to think about Cascades, it's going to be at a high level the same thing as Volcano. 
Um, except it was written in the 1990s, so they make heavy use of how great it is to be object-oriented, because that, that was in vogue at the time. Um, but they have a bunch of other stuff that goes a little bit deeper than that, uh, that is improvements over Volcano. And the main one there is that uh, they're going to materialize the transformations that you want to do for your operators and your query plan on the fly as you, as you want to examine them, or sort of as you enumerate the plan, as, as, it, as it's called, rather than just saying, all right, I need to look at this operator, let me materialize everything, then I'll figure out which ones actually I want to look at and examine and maybe traverse down into, into, the, into the tree. So the way, again, at a high level to think about this is that the, the, the rewriting phase of the query plan is essentially this direct mapping function allows us to go from one operator to the next uh, for simplistic things rather than having to do an exhaustive search every single time. And this has allowed them to be, again, to be more efficient. So the, the, at a high level, the, the main t uh, points we want to focus on are, are, the, are the following. And again, part of the reason why I had you guys read the Columbia paper so that it was a master's thesis from the 1990s rather than the Cascades paper uh, because the Cascades paper is not very good. Uh, they, keep, they keep banging on about how it's object-oriented and isn't that great without actually really getting into the details of what's actually going on. Those 30 pages from the Columbia thesis, in my opinion, are the best description of what Cascades actually does. Um, and, I mean, the, 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 it's not an exact implementation. They do deviate in, for some minor things. But at a high level, if you understand Columbia, then I would say you understand Cascades. Um, again, at, at, for the high-level constructs. All right, so the first thing is that all our optimization tasks are implemented as essentially structs or data structures where we can define them based on the pattern we want to match and then the rule we fire, what, what modification we make. Um, and again, this is, this is thinking, this, think of, thinking of this as how you'd write this in a declarative language, right? You would write this as like, match this pattern, apply this rule, rather than like if-then-else stuff. The, we can use our rules to enforce uh, the, pr the physical properties of the data that we would want. Uh, so if we say we know that this output needs to be uh, sorted based on some key, then we declare that as a rule that we apply to uh, one of these groups we're going to create. And the, the rules engine will make sure that that gets enforced, that that's still held valid as we do our transformations. We can also provide a, a way to prioritize the, the ordering of moves by a, a promise mechanism. So basically, it's um, you define the priorities for you want for your transformation. And then as you traverse the tree, you can actually reorganize those or reshuffle those, those priorities based on how, what, what you start seeing as you go down the tree. So the way to think about this is like, I know, like as I make a move, as I traverse the tree, I can then go check to see whether my priorities and my transformations have changed. Because some, because we, we, know, uh, we know where we're at the higher point of the tree, we can then infer something about what we would see down different branches. And maybe you want to go down one branch versus another. And being very hand wavy here, it'll make more sense when, it, when I show an example. And the last one is that, uh, we're going to have our predicates, or we tr basically treat our predicates as first class entities in our system, um, like logical and physical operators, and allow us to optimize them or transform them just as we would as like relational algebra operators. So this is, again, this is the, what Eric, Newton, and William are doing for the, their class project. Like they're using our Cascades optimizer framework to do the query rewriting stuff, right? Because at a high level, it works the same way. All right, so let's get it, let's understand now at the lowest level what Cascades is actually doing. So the first thing we need to understand is how they're going to represent uh, the, the operators within our query plan. So they're going to use the term expression to mean an operator with, uh, with zero or more input expressions. So I realized that for the entire semester, I've been using the term expression to mean a piece of a, of a predicate, like a where clause, like you know, a equals one. I'm calling that an expression. In Cascades, it's a, it's a bigger thing. It's like joining A on B, right? So the, for this particular query here, we're used as a running example. So we want to select star from A, join B, do an inner join on B, on A dot ID equals B dot ID, and inner join with C, where C dot ID equals A dot ID. So a logical expression to represent this join operation could be this, A join B followed by join C, right? 
again, as we as we see, we're going to enumerate over different different join orderings, right? We can because we can rely on the associativity and commutativity properties of relational algebra to be able to say, you know, B join A join join C or C join B join A, right? We can change this up in any, in any different way. And then we're also going to have physical expressions, which are now going to be uh, we want them to, be able to have a, a logical equivalency from the logical expression it came from, uh, and then we can derive the physical expression that, that actually implements or performs what this expression wants to do. So now we're going to substitute using subscripts to say what the, how we're actually going to, going to execute the, the component of our expression. So here we can say A, and then we'll have a little subscript that says sequential for sequential scan, uh, join, and we put HJ for hash join. So this is sequential scan on A, sequential scan on B, and do a hash join. And then we have a, a nested, nested loop join uh, on the sequential scan on C. Or we, if we have indexes, we can define what index we're going to do a lookup on right, for our low-low access methods and then change out the different uh, the join algorithms we want to use. So now that we have, again, we have logical expressions and physical expressions. So now what we're going to do is we're going to combine them together into what are called groups. And so a group is going to be a uh, a a a set of logically equivalent expressions um, that are defined based on the output that they're going to produce. So this right here is going to be a group. Uh, it's, the, its output will be the, the join on A, B, and C. And then I'll have uh, equivalent expressions that do the, the represent the, lo okay, the logical expressions and then the physical expressions. And all of these are, are equivalent. So the, the logical expressions are going to be in this case here, all the possible join ordering permutations that produce our target output. As I, as I was saying in the last slide, for this, for this particular query, A join B join C, right? I can have you know, A join B join C, B join, A, B join C join A, and so forth. Right? I'm putting the, the three dots to represent, like I'm doing an exhaustive. These, these are all of them. And then I have now for each logical expression, I can have in uh, one or more physical expressions that are equivalent to, again, they produce all the correct output, but are derived from one of these logical expressions. So this one here is that sequential scan with a nested loop join on B, which we, we're using sequential scan, which does a nested loop join on C with uses a sequential scan. And again, I, I can have an exhaustive list of everything here. All right. So this obviously gets really huge for a single group. Right, I'm just I'm joining three three tables here, I, I you know, and within one um, for one logical expression, right? I can have all possible indexes I can look up my tables on, all possible uh, join algorithms, right? Whether I'm using a special scan or not, I said so this this thing can get can get quite big, so we, we're going to need a way to cut down on how much you know how much state we have to store for our groups. Um, and we want to also potentially cut down the number of groups or number of these expressions we have to examine, right? Because again, the when as we're doing a traversal, in order to understand whether this 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 expression is is going to be better than the one we see the best expression we've seen so far for this particular query, I got to go to the cost model and ask it what's the estimated cost of executing this expression. So that gets that's expensive, and I, I want to try to avoid doing that. So the way they're going to cut down on this. Uh, on this search space is, I guess the representation of the search space is to combine them together into what are called multi-expressions. And the idea here is that it's a way to represent a portion of an expression to say that the actual implementation, whether it's logical or physical, but how it's actually going to be uh, executed or performed is defined lo lower in the tree. And I don't need to define it at my particular group. So again, my output is still A join B join C. But now my logical expressions, instead of saying anything about how I'm, at, uh, how I'm joining A and B, I'm just saying I know that there's a, there's a multi-expression down below me in the tree that will tell me how I want to form this logical expression A, A join B. And then likewise for, the, for C here, uh, I'm just saying that somewhere below me in the tree, that'll tell you how to actually access C. So taking this example, A join B join C, now when I convert that to my physical multi-expression, again, I still have bracket AB bracket, bracket C bracket, 
Okay, because this is saying below me in the tree, and it'll tell you how to actually do this join from a physical operator standpoint. Below me in the tree, I'll tell you how to actually access C, but now I'm actually defining my what join algorithm I'm using. So this is just got, it's got placeholder, it's like a virtual reference to something below in the tree that I'll make a decision about how we're actually going to perform that later on. But at this point right now, when I'm looking at this, this group in my, in my tree, my, my search tree, I don't need to know anything about how, how I'm actually doing this. Right? And the idea here is essentially try to sort of uh, eliminate the fan, down, the fan out, right? So this is, this is the example I was saying before about uh, because we're going top down, we can infer something about the priorities of how to traverse the tree and do our transformations based on what we know what we're at, where we're at now. So in this particular case here, I could either go down to see how to, how to join A and B or how to scan C. If there's something I know about my query and the data I'm accessing, I may choose to go down one path versus another, right? Like I may say, well, C, I know, I don't have any indexes, it's always gonna be a sequential scan, so I, don't, I, don't, I won't go down there for now, I'll, just, I'll go down the other way. Or there's some other aspect of, the, of the, what's, what the, what's in your predicate to say that A, B, is, no matter how I'm you know, joining it, it's always gonna produce uh, an all set, so don't traverse this way, traverse the other way. Because I'll get, I'll get more information going down the other path. Right? You can't do that in a, in a bottom-up approach because you're sort of starting from nothing and you can't sort of peek ahead about what, what the query plan is actually going to look like at the top. I, mean, I suppose you can, but I, I don't think anybody implements it that way. So is, is this multi-expression stuff clear? Right, again, it's just placeholders that, uh, where we can assume that it's completely optimized uh, and we'll, we'll figure out how to, how to deal with it later. All right, so now that we have, we have groups, we have multi-expressions, now we can define what our rules look like. So again, a rule is a transformation of an expression uh, to a new expression that's logically equivalent. And they're going to have two classes of rules, right? So we're just going to call, if we go from a logical to logical uh, transformation, we're going to call that, a, or logical to logical operator, we'll call that a transformation rule. If we're going logical to physical, then we'll call that an implementation rule. These are just the labels that they're using. So as I was saying, the, the, each rule is going to be defined as a, as, a, as a struct or an object, and that is going to be comprised of two parts. The first is going to be the pattern, is, which will be the structure that we're going to look for in our, uh, in our logical expressions in, in, our, in our query plan to then determine whether we should fire this rule. So we match our pattern here, then we know we would now need to fire the, the substitution rule, which then describes how, what the effect will be after we apply our transformation, or, or how we're gonna modify the expression to put it into a new form. Right, whether it's, again, logical to logical or logical to physical. And it's just like a trigger. My, my pattern, this matches, that fires a trigger, that then applies the substitution. So let's look at an example. So they say this is my pattern here. Uh, and the pattern is essentially looking to see whether I have two joins um, that, uh, that are, you know, are one after another. Right, so I, I am looking for inner joins or echo joins, so I have two echo joins here. So the output of this echo join feeds into this echo join. Right? Now over here, I'm just saying these are generic groups. So I don't care what's actually in here. Right? I don't care whether it's a scan, I don't care whether it's another join. All my pattern needs to match to see whether I have two joins like this. And then, my transfer, and then I'll do transformation based on this. So this particular uh, pattern would match this query plan here. So I have A join B, equi join, and then I see, see I have a multi-expression to say I'm joining A and B, I don't know how, uh, and then I'm gonna join that with C. So the echo join here and echo join there feeding into each other. I don't care what these other ones here, for, for, for simplicity, we're just saying, we're saying get A, get B, get C. Like it's the access method to get tuples that we then feed into these operators. But I don't care. I only care about these two here. So I could have now a transformation rule that will do a rotation to move the, uh, the, 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 the echo join child from my parent echo join from the left side to the right side of the query plan. So I'm moving the, the join of B and C over here. 
right? And I, and I, and I flipped around my, um, the table. So now I'm A join B join C, whereas in the original one, it was, it was A join B join C, or with A, B first, and then followed by C, all right? The implementation rule would, could substitute these echo joins with now to say I'm doing a certain sort merge. So I'm actually defining what algorithm I want to use for my join operator here. Right, so again, the, 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 the overall structure is the same, but now my, what, what were logical expressions are now physical expressions in my query plan. All right. Windows not, should not restart. Okay. So um, what's one particular, what's one problem that we could have with this, uh, with this transformation rule here, the logical to logical? You have a rotate right to left. Yeah. Exactly. So he says, if you have a rotate right to left, which you would have, then you can get stuck in an infinite loop because I'm going to rotate uh, left to right, get this, then another rule gets fired that says rotate uh, left to right and go, go back to here. Now I'm stuck in an infinite loop. So this is where the, the memo table would help us, right? Because we'll be able to identify some way that we've already done this, we've already been to this, this, this query plan before, so we don't need to fire that rule to go look at it again. And so the way they're going to do that is essentially maintain a hash table. So the originally, original Cascade paper says they use a graph structure. I think we use a hash table. Other implementations I've seen use a hash table. The basic idea is that you have a way to hash the group in a, um, in a descriptive, descriptive manner to allow you to uniquely identify uh, you know, one, you know, that, that this group has already been examined. And then you just keep track of uh, you know, what, what that cost was for, for when you've seen that group before, if there's one associated with, with it, and that way you know that you don't need to go back and, and do the transformation again, and then, then hit up the cost, cost model. You just say, I've already seen this, let me just use what I've cached before, all right? So the idea again is that all equivalent operator trees and any plans that are, that are stored together in a group We'll still be put into the same entry in our, in our memorization table, and we don't have to go, you know, re revisit things over and over again. All right. So this is pretty straightforward. So the other important thing we need to be mindful about of as now is as we do our optimization is this notion of the the principle of op optimality. So this is sometimes called Bellman's principle of optimality. It came from, I think, the 1960s or 70s from like, control theory. But the, the basic idea is that if we have an optimal plan, then every sub-plan in our optimal plan has to be optimal. It's sort of one of these like tautologies like, or like, self-evident truths. So if I have the optimal plan, and my optimal plan is comprised of sub-plans, right? like, like a group, for example, then I know that in order for me to be the optimal plan, all my subplans have to be optimal. Because for a particular subplan, if there was another plan that was optimal, then I wouldn't be the optimal plan. Right? So that basically is going to allow us to be able to just to reason about the uh, sort of subplans by themselves and determine whether we can find the optimal plan for, for our subplan. And then once we find it, we can cache that result and not have to revisit it if we've seen before in our, in our memo table. Now, the, the, the principle of optimality is not specific to cascades or top-down top search. Right? This still applies uh, in the, the bottom-up approach as well. But the difference here is because we're doing a top-down search, this, uh, we can use the branch and bound method to identify that we've, we've gone down some path. And that path we've gone down so far is worse than the best plan we've, we've seen so far, the, op the operable plan we've seen so far, then we know that no matter how far we go down in that, in that path in our search tree, we won't find a better plan. So we can just cut it off and not traverse any further. Right? This is just the branch and bound techniques for optimization problems. So we can rely on this to make decisions about how to not go down and, and, and pr certain paths and prune, prune our search space. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So for this one, for simplicity, I, I'm, I'm exploding out all, some of the groups already. In, in, in practice, what would happen is at the very beginning, 
you would only have, you, you start with the group at the top, right, with your, with, with your output is. But for simplicity, my animations, I just showed everything all at once. So again, at the beginning, our memo table is empty. So I'm going to start at the top, uh, and we want to now fire off a rule to say, how can we take our, uh, sort of our basic logical expression that we want to join A, B, and C, like generate what is a, a equivalent logical expression for this, for this, uh, for this guy here. So the first one could be A join B combined together as a multi-expression, and then I'm joining that with a multi-expression that tells me how to access C. So now I need to make a decision of which path I want to go down. For simplicity's sake, we'll say, let's figure out how to join A, B first before we go down C. So we're going to go down, go down here. So now, again, we, now we want to apply, again, our, our transformation rules to generate different logical expressions or multi-expressions that could produce the output for, that we expect, right? So here again, we have a multi-expression on A. That means in A is by itself. Means that we're, we're going to get the data somehow. We don't know how yet. And then we join that with B, and then B is a multi-expression to say, you know, we don't know how we're going to do it. We're not, we don't know how we're going to access it either. So then we go down this path here, and then we have our logical expression get A that represents, that, that, that implements this, this output expression we want. So then we can transform this into different physical expressions, which could either be a sequential scan on A, which is the default thing. If you don't have any indexes, you just read the data. Or I could do an index scan on A. Now, again, for simplicity, I'm just saying I'm doing an index scan. I'm not saying what index. But in, in practice, you would have for every possible index that could, be, that could satisfy the predicate I'm trying to look up on for my table, I, I would have a physical expression for each of those. Because each of those could be costed separately because they would have different selectivity characteristics or different cardinalities, and that would produce you know, more or less tuples than other indexes. And I can use that in my cost model to determine uh, uh, whether this, you know, which index is, is printing out the most data more quickly. So let's say for this one here, the index is, is a bad choice. The sequential scan is what, is what we want. So for, for, so for whatever reason, this sequential scan is faster. So we're going to assign it a cost of 10. Again, this is an artificial synthetic number. This is internal to our database system. It doesn't really mean anything in the real world. Uh, we'll talk about cost models next, next, next class. But this is just some way to us to tell us that this, you know, this one is better than this one. I say the index scan cost is 20 for whatever reason, but the sequential scan is cost 10. So, that, so that, this one's better. We're going to choose this. So now my memo table for my, uh, my multi-expression on just accessing A, I'll record that the sequential scan on A, that physical operator, is the best one I've seen so far. With, with, we had to access thing with a cost of, of, of 10. So then now I go back up into my, my, my plan, back, back up here. And now I want to go down the other side and do the same thing on B. And same thing I say, I have a sequential scan. The cost is 20. That's the best I've seen. So I add that my entry in there. So now I could have other rules that I would fire that would explode out my physical expressions. All right, sorry, sorry, logical expressions. So, right, we only looked at A join B. Now I can look at B join A. But now I do need to do the same thing. I can go down into my to the these two different groups and perform that same cost evaluation to determine whether the sequential scan was better than the index scan. But I don't need to do that because I would look and say, oh, my memo table, I already know what the best way to access A and B are, these two sequential scans. So I don't even bother going down and, look, and looking. Right? So again, that, that avoids having to do redundant work. Now I want to fire the rules to convert the logical expressions to a physical expression. So this is just a, a subset of them, right? I could be doing a a, a, with, a join B with a nested loop join, sort merge join, and then possibly flipping the order. I get all possible combinations based on what my rules tell me to do. And then now I need to get the, uh, the physical cost of this. So let's say again, I know how to access A, I know how to access B, and then for whatever reason, the, the sort merge join for this one here, it has the lowest cost. So now the cost for this particular group in my query plan is the summation of all my sub subplans plus whatever my operator is doing here. So the cost of accessing A was 10, the cost of accessing 20 or, or B was 20, plus the cost of accessing this, the sort merge was say 50. So it's 50 plus 10 plus 20. Right? So now again, this is where the branch bound stuff comes into play. Like if I wanted to go down maybe down you know, another path, 
and I know my cost so far at, at this point of the tree is greater than 50, then no matter what I do below me in the query plan, I'll never get, I'll never get better because this cost is always increasing as you go down because you're just adding in more operators that add more to your cost. So I know I don't need to traverse down it and look at other things. Yes? So you said early, in an earlier lecture that the nice thing of sort merge joins, like if anybody higher above in the pipeline wants something sorted, right, sort merge already does it for you. But like in this model, like you can't really detect that like someone above you will want something sorted, right? Because you're assuming that any optimization comes from below you. And not that like with your decision now, like you see what I mean? Yeah, so his statement is, in my example here, I'm just saying the sort merge is better, and I'm actually ignoring the physical properties of what the things expect the data to look like up above. But I said, of course, that uh, if we, we had an order by, we want things sort of on a certain key, and I was, could join in that key, then a sort merge join would be preferable to a hash join. But in my example here, I'm not including the physical properties. You're right, I'm ignoring that. So the way it would work is for the group, you would define the enforcer rules of what you want the physical property to look like. So let's say that ABC needed to be sorted on, uh, you know, on B.ID. Then I would know as I go down here that anything that I would want to pick has to generate, the physical operator has to generate an output that's sorted on the way that this guy wants up above, right? So your point is that like, I could keep going down here and looking at a bunch of stuff, but then end up coming back up here and picking up nested loop join, which would then generate a, an invalid output and therefore that's I shouldn't it shouldn't have looked at that at all but you know think in a real query plan you're you know, at the, the very bottom of the leaves of, of the query plan are all these access methods on the actual table so that's not actually wasted work because again I'm just going to cache it in my memo table so even though I may end up choosing an invalid query plan going down this path that that would violate my enforcer rules I still did useful work, and now I could come back down a second time and look at the cert merge, but not look all the way down because I've already computed what the cost of those access methods are. Right, so it's, you could pass hints down, I guess. I actually, I actually don't know how they do it. Because um, my understanding, the rules are always defined on what, like, who's expecting the data to come in. And I don't, I don't know whether you can pass that down and say, oh, by the way, pick something that gives me the data that I want. I suppose you could, though. Yeah, there's no reason you couldn't do that. Then everything just works. Yes? How many merge A at the same point, the merges will be it? His question is, can you merge A and C first, then merge, and then, uh, mean join. Can I join A, C first, then join B? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, right, um, I don't think I have an example of this, but, so this is just the same thing going on the other side. So, I started off A, join B, followed by join C. That's just the way I did it. There's no reason I, I couldn't look at the other possible permutations. In fact, when I showed you what a group looked like, going back a few slides, um, yeah, here, right? Like, in my example, I just started off with doing A, A join B join C. But like, in actuality, you're absolutely right. All these different logical expressions are all equivalent with each other. So depending on the priorities I could set up, in, in my query optimizer, I could say, look at BC first, then join A. Yeah. For simplicity, we just did it in the order that they came in. But like, say again, I know something about what the data looks like in B, what the data looks like in C, then maybe I want to figure this one out first, because that'll get me to a quicker query plan more, more quick, a better query plan more quickly. Yeah. So yeah, you, so you define rules, sorry, you define priorities for the transformations that allow you to determine in what order you apply, the, the, apply them. So the, but that's hard. So the time complexity is still exponential. His question is, is the time complexity still ex exponential? Absolutely, yeah. But like again, we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Like, like as we said, actually said in this last class already too, we're not doing an exhaustive search here, right? Because it's MP complete, it's exponential to look at all possible join orderings. So like nobody's gonna let you run the query optimizer for days to figure out the best query plan. Like, I, like you wanna come up with something in a reasonable amount of time. Right, so the, the, the amount of time you're gonna search is bounded. So in, rather than looking at useless things, you can use these priorities to transform things into query plans you think are gonna be near optimal more quickly, right? And then, again, this is like, this is the black art of, of these optimizers that, that 
the that the commercial guys are much better at than the than the open source ones, right? And we'll see this. The paper you'll read next class, like SQL Server does the best because SQL Server has the best optimizer. They okay, have the best class model too. But it's it's more than just like you know, anybody can write a branch mount search. It's all the extra stuff about inferring the semantics of what the query is actually doing, plus marrying with what you know about the data you collected from statistics to help you decide how to do these transformations. But we don't do this in our system. God, no. Um, any other questions? Okay. So going back to our example here. Yeah, so we left off here. So again, so the... Again, we just fill this out more. Actually, this is exactly what I just told you. So yeah, so now I start looking at the other permutations of my logical expressions, the different join orderings, and then I start looking at all these other groups. But again, because I have this memorization table, I know that I never need to compute the, recompute the cost for the low-level access methods. I just reuse what I have in, in, my, in my memo table. And then now to what I was just saying before, we, sh we showed this slide last class, but now it should make more sense, is how do you actually decide when to stop searching because I don't want to search forever. Uh, the most common technique that I know about is using wall clock time, or obviously when you exhaust your trans your, all your transformations. Like if, if I know I've fired all my rules, there's nothing else for me to possibly ever, ever look at, so I, there's not, you know, so I just stop. Um, usually for the really complex queries, you never get to this, uh, um, and then this, this is what people always just use. Right? I'll say I'll stop after 500 milliseconds for you know, 10 seconds or something. Um, and then w whatever the best plan I've seen so far, that's what it is, I just go with it. Right. And again, for, for our really simple examples here, we're joining three tables, you may think, oh, well, how hard can it actually be? You know, you start having more complex queries, uh, non-trivial join predicates. Um, I, the number of tables, I think, is a bad metric or to determine how good somebody's optimizer is. Because it's like, I remember talking to Orca guys from Greenplum, like, oh, we can do 35 table joins. Then I talked to MemSQL, and like, oh, we can do 75 table joins. And then uh, the Splice Machine guys told me they can do 135. So like, I don't know whether that's actually a good way to th think about this. I think uh, it's not the number of tables, but it's how complex you're actually joining them. How much of the memoization is saved between individual queries? His question is, how much of the memoization saved, saved in between individual queries? As far as I know, nothing. Right, because, like, going back here, so, in this case here, right, so, so, so the cost is usually going to be, uh, and for an MMA system, it's, it's the number of tuples you're either inputting or outputting. So at the lowest level of the query plan, it's the access method, so it's the number of tuples I'm outputting. But that's going to be based on my selectivity, or of, of my predicate. So that's going to vary from one query to the next. So I would now need to encode some way to say, I'm, my predicate is on this table, and therefore I, I can cache it. And then you have to now include information about, well, what, did the state of the, what was the state of the database when I computed that cost? Because you know, say I keep it in my memo table from, you know, from things I saw yesterday, but I dumped the database and reloaded it back in with all new data, all my cost estimates are, are now completely off. They, they usually do it they, on a per query basis. Um, there is starting to be some research into using deep learning or, or machine learning to now to derive, build models that can then do these kind of estimates and things like that. Um, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that next next class. Like, all this hinges, like, again, there's just so many different facets of things you can optimize and, and tweak to make this work better. Like, how good your cost model is going to matter a lot, because that's going to affect how you pick the join orders. How you uh, prioritize what transformations to apply can tell you, you know, are you going to spend time looking at useful parts of the, of the query plan space, or are you going to spend looking times at useless, you know, useless things? Um, all, all these things are sort of uh, can, can play into the, or will greatly affect the quality of the query plan. Um, and I would say that, again, the commercial guys are much better than this than the open source guys. Okay. So I just want to go through some examples of Cascades implementations. So there's a bunch of standalone ones which are actually kind of cool. So th these are like, they're not the optimizer generators that I talked about in the beginning where, again, you have these declarative rules and you, and you feed them in and then they compile out. 
they sp the, the engine spits out a compiled or a the the source code to actually apply them or drop the code into your own system. Um, actually, Op plus plus does this, but these other ones here are sort of meant to be these standalone optimizers. So the idea is that like I have my database system, and then I have a, on another machine or running on the same machine a separate service that's my query optimizer, and I send along statistics and my query plan and other information metadata about my database to this this optimization framework, and then it crunches on it and spits back to me a uh, the query plan, and I run that. So the you guys already read about Columbia. Um, the two more modern ones are Pivotal's Orca and Apache Calcite. So we'll talk about this in, in a few more slides, but, but Orca was developed by Pivotal for Greenplum, and then they, they broke it out of the Greenplum source code to make it actually be a standalone thing because they want to use it for other, other parts of their, 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 their database ecosystem. And then Calcite came out of the LucidDB project. And again, it's, 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 a, it's the same idea. It's a standalone service that does query optimization. For integrated cascade systems, uh, again, SQL Server has is based on cascades, at least publicly. That's, uh, they don't publicly say this, but this is what the conventional wisdom is in, in academia based on talking to people that work there. Uh, Tandem nonstop SQL was, this is actually one of the first data, distributed databases or fault tolerant databases out of the 1980s. Um, they got bought by DEC, that then got bought by HP. It's still there. As far as I know, it's in maintenance mode. Uh, if you run... It, it, any a large number of ATM machines or, or, or bank uh, banks are still running this. You'd be surprised. This is still very common, and it runs on like specialized fault tolerant uh, hardware, which is pretty cool. Clusterix was or is a uh, distributed version of MySQL. They just got bought by um, the MariaDB guys uh, in the last year, and so it, there's a little snippet in their documentation that, that says like. They had their own custom optimizer called Sierra, and they, they briefly mentioned that, it, that, that it's based on Cascades. And then our beloved uh, dead database, Peloton, uh, was using Cascades and still using Cascades. We haven't ported that code over, but that's, that's our goal for, for, for this year, to bring that back. And again, but like all the, the fancy stuff I was saying, like the priority rules, uh, the declare rule, rule the you know, declaring rules in, in a DSL, we don't do any of that. We just have a, a, basic, a basic search engine. Okay, so I briefly want to talk a little bit about the paper you guys read. I'm not, I apologize, we're just not going to have time to go into details of it, plus I don't fully understand it myself. Um, let me, I, yeah, let's leave it at that. Okay, so, but it, it, it's going to bring up, a, it brings up a really important part um, that I want to sort of show you why you have to do something beyond just cascades uh, and get into the things that the, the German guys were talking about. So, and all the examples we showed in this lecture and last lecture have made the following assumptions, or sort of we only looked at simple queries, that they were only doing echo joins or inner joins. Uh, they had really simple join predicates that were only referencing two tables at a time, like a.id equals b.id. Um, and there was no cross product joins. There was no Cartesian products. It was, again, always, always echo joins. But in the real world, the queries are way more complex. So you see outer joins, semi joins, and anti joins. Anti joins are real are basically does something not equal something, right? Um, and what happens is the transformation rules, as I've described them, uh, they'll still work, but they may generate invalid query plans, right? Because because in the cascades example I showed you, I assumed the join orderings were or the join was commutative. I could make it A B followed by C, or I could do B C followed by A. All that were still valid. But when you start looking at more complex queries, the, not all those, those, those reorderings are, are, are valid. So a really simple example would be a query like this. I do a, a select star from A, but now I'm going to do a left outer join on B, and then I do a full outer join on C with B and C together. So the query plan, ABC. I, I, it's ABC. It's, 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 go with that, OK. Sorry. Uh, so in this case here, I can't reorder this join. I have to go A, B, followed by C, right? And the reason is because of this full outer join. Because as I'm doing, in order to do this join, I need to know the value of C. Oh, sorry, I need to know the value of B.val as it comes out of this join here. 
But since I don't know that before I do the join, I can't do this join first. So I can't reorder this. But now there was nothing in my transformation rules in Cascades that, as, as I showed them so far, that took this in consideration. I basically now have to, you know, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's incompatible with Cascades, that you can then generate rules that can enforce this for you to make sure you don't have these funky reorderings, but the, so the traditional way of doing that is, is kind of inefficient. So this problem is called plan enumeration. So the idea is that how am I going to generate join orderings efficiently that don't violate the, the, the ordering correctness of, of, of the query? And the, the basic approach to this is that I'll just generate all possible join orderings, just as I did in Cascades, and then after the fact, I'll test to see whether they're going to produce an incorrect result. Or in the paper you guys read, they're essentially doing graph partitioning or hypergraph partitioning to incrementally add in uh, incrementally add in portions of the query plan to this hypergraph, and then make sure that they only add in things that would not violate the correctness guarantees. So part of what I was saying in the, at the beginning. Uh, that it's not clear to me whether the, the top-down, the Cascades model versus the bottom-up approach is better uh, because there's papers that tell you this is back and forth between one side says the other one's better, the other side says the other one's better. So this problem here of how to generate correct join orderings occurs both in bottom-up bottom, bottom up and top-down. And so the paper I had you guys read came out in 2008 and it's called Dynamic Programming Strikes Back and it makes the, the case that the, the top-down approach is, is, is too slow, is incorrect, because of this particular problem. They're not going to be able to efficiently generate proper join orderings that will that, that produce a correct result. But then the problem is the, the first author of this paper then wrote a second paper five years later that says counter-strike gen generic top-down join enumeration for hypergraphs. So he basically says, no, this is, yes, this, we solved this problem for, for bottom-up, but here's how to solve it for top-down. Now top-down's better, right? And the first author here wrote a whole like uh, you know PhD thesis on this, so I actually don't know what the answer is. I have no idea. Um, Germans. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this like like this is super hard. Like I got, I I got I got. Ugh. You know that's like it's called a, like it's called a rabbit hole. Like you go on Wikipedia and then like you just start reading something after something after something. You keep following the links and you just before you know it, like you went in to go read about something about you know. North Dakota, then you end up reading about Hitler. Like, like you just the way you get there is so. This was a rabbit hole for me. Like, I I started reading this paper, and then I see who cites them and who they cite, and then I end up with this other paper. So I, I I'm more confused now than I was uh, last week. So <laughs> so the, the main takeaway I want you to get from this paper is that the organizing so. If you only consider inner joins and simple predicates uh, in, in the query plan, then you can represent that as a, as a graph, a simple undirected graph, and therefore the, the traversal is of, of enumerating different join orderings, correct join orderings, is simple. So these guys are arguing that you actually need a model as a, as a hypergraph where one edge can, can be comprised of, of multiple vertices and each vertex in the graph represents a, a, a table you're joining. And so by modeling as that, then you just have this, they have this algorithm where basically you can iterate over the subgraphs and then iterate, iter incrementally adding new edges to, uh, to other nodes to complete a new query plan. But then every single time you add the node, you're checking to see whether that would violate uh, some the correctness criteria of, of the query plan, and then you know you don't need to, you need to add it. And they can show they can do this in in O1. Later on in the I think in the subsequent paper from the other German, right? Uh, to be clear, so Guido was Thomas's advisor, uh, PhD advisor, and then Thomas went to Munich and he and he does more dynamic programming stuff. And then Guido then wrote this paper here to say you know here's how to do it top down. So. In this, in this paper you guys read, they can do it O1. I think in subsequent papers they can do it as well. So this is very unsatisfying because I wanted to, I had this big idea, but I'm going to show you examples, I walk through it, but I, I don't fully understand what they're actually doing myself. So, so the basic idea here is that 
they can incrementally add things and make sure as they add them that they're still correct and then not worry about checking after the fact whether they violated the correctness ordering. And they can do that efficiently. So at some point, we, we should... I'd be interested in learning more about, about this. We'll, I'll, I'll make a comment about this at, at the end. All right. So in a short amount of time, I want to talk about some other things. So the other aspect of this is that we've been uh, sort of ignoring how to do predicate optimizations or how to deal with predicates. We just assume that we're using that to figure out how, what we need to join, but not reason about the, uh, what other optimizations we can apply. So as I already said, the, the, the one team in the class here, they're applying the cascade search model as uh, the search framework that we've built to actually do query rewriting with, you know, without a cost model to, you know, to fix Boolean logic and other things. So in the same way that we do our transformations from, from one expression type to another expression type in cascades, we can do the same thing with, with our predicates and our where clauses. And we can find some, there's a bunch of simple tricks we can do to, to improve the efficiency of the query plan without having to go through the full cascades uh, search. The, the main technique, we, you know, the probably most important thing you want to do is always predicate pushdown. Um, and so the way, the way you actually can do this, there's different ways, uh, or how you actually do this can be done in different ways. So you can do this as a logical transformation in cascades. Uh, basically, you have a transformation rule to say, uh, I, I, I have a separate projection node, but instead I want to roll that in to be combined with my scan operator at the, at the bottom of the query plan. Um, and then later on, you just determine, you know, once you transform it back to a physical plan or into a physical expression, you use the cost model to determine whether that was the, the correct thing to do. Uh, I think this is what we do in our own system. Um, the second approach is to do this as a separate rewrite phase. Basically, before the query plan goes into cascades, you have rules that say, uh, that say I always know I want to put my predicates at the bottom, so let me go ahead and, and do that, right? So this is simple to do for, for really easy predicates, but when you have more complex predicates that may com be combining multiple uh, tables into your, your expressions, then that becomes, that becomes more tricky. The last approach, which I forget who does this, um, but I've seen it before, is to do what's called late binding, where you just strip out all the expressions, don't worry about them as you're running, you know, running cascades, and then after the fact, you can say, oh yeah, I have these, I have these predicates, let me go add them back to the different operators. Right? Uh, I think it's a bad idea because again, you need to, you need the expressions to know what the selectivity is of your 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 predicates and for your 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 scan operators or your your joins to determine whether one's better than another. Right? This allows you to reason very easily about what the query plan is going to do. But this is this is basically doing query optimization disconnected from what the database actually looks like. So this is a terrible idea. It's either two, these two approaches are what you, what you actually want to do. The other thing we want, uh, that we could do uh, that actually doesn't come up in the literature too much is do uh, predicate reordering. So in all my examples so far, if I have a where clause where it's like a equals something, or a.id equals something, and a.val equals something, we just assume that we would apply the expressions in the order as they're defined in the where clause. But what you actually really want to do is determine which of the predicates are, are the most selective meaning which predicates are going to prune out the most data more quickly, and apply that predicate first, then apply the, the, less, you know, the second most uh, selective one second, and so forth. The idea is that you want to cut out the, as much useless data as quickly as possible. So that's an easy optimization that you do, and this is what the cost model can help us do by collecting statistics about the data. But another thing we actually may want to do, there may be cases where the predicate is actually very selective, but it's expensive to compute, so maybe I don't want to do it first, and maybe I don't even want to do it as I'm doing scanning the data. I'm going to want to push that up to some later part of the of the query plan because the cost of computing that predicate uh, is is greater than the cost of you know moving useless data up up the query plan. So let's say I have something like this. I have a predicate where foo.id equals one two three four, and I have a predicate that says once compute the the shaf five twelve hash of one of my values and see whether that matches some other hash, right? So there's no, no longer just something equals something, you're not invoking a hashing function, an, an expensive one too. So for this one here, if my optimizer can not only consider the selectivity of, of the predicate, but also the, the, the cost of computing the predicate, 
then for this particular query here, maybe I want to do, and this is so simple, there's no join, but I want to do this one first, even though that, that may not prune out a, a lot, but then I do this one last because it's going to be very expensive. So as far as I know, no commercial system does this, in particular because, you know, well, this is a built-on function, so you wouldn't treat this as a black box. You, you, can, you can estimate what the, the, the execution time this, this will be. Um, but nobody does the, 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 the migration of a predicate to up and down the query plan, right? They'll at least reorder it based on the cost of it. And this is, this is something that you have to incorporate in your cost model uh, as, as, you're, as you're doing your transformations for, for your predicates. And this is from a paper from 1993, uh, from Mike Stonebaker and, and Joe Hellerstein. But again, was, they did this in Postgres, but as far as I know, nobody actually imp nobody implements the technique that, that they propose here. All right, so now I want to quickly go through some examples of, uh, of, of you know, other optimizers out there. So I've already talked about this a little bit. So Pivotal, Pivotal company, I shouldn't say uh, Pivotal was, uh, Pivotal, EMC bought Greenplum, which is a distributed version of Postgres. So now EMC had a database division. Then VMware bought SQL Fire or, or Gemfire, and they had a database division. Both of those companies did not want database divisions. So then they, 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 they broke off their database divisions, and they formed a new company together called Pivotal. So Pivotal was like the database division of VMware plus EMC put together. And so they had Greenplum, and then they built their own standalone uh, cascade op optimizer called Orca. Um, and the idea was that not just for doing query optimization on Greenplum, but they also had this thing called Hawk, which is like a query engine on top of, top of Hadoop. That thing needed the query optimizer, but rather than re-implementing it all over again, they had Orca be a, a standalone service that both Hawk and Greenplum c can connect to and do, and do optimization, right? So the way it works is basically you send a bunch of XML to Orca along with your query plan, like the stats, what the catalog looks like, and uh, any other metadata about the database. They run ca a cascade, search on it, do your transformations, do your optimization, and then spit you back a query plan that you can actually run. And they do actually, this actually can support multi-threaded search, which for now we've assumed it's been single-threaded. There's no reason you couldn't do a multi-threaded branch of bound search. And both, actually in both dynamic programming and um, both top-down and bottom-up, you can do multi-threaded, and this supports it. So we actually looked at this at the very beginning of Peloton. At the time, uh, one, it sort of looked like the project was dead on GitHub. There was, wasn't a lot of active commits. And then there wasn't any documentation about how to prepare all this XML stuff you had to send it. They've since rectified that, um, and it's actually gotten much better. But at this point, at that point, we already wrote our own, so it was too late for us. Um, but there's two actually interesting things that they talk about in their paper that are something worth considering. And again, thinking about if, if, if you actually had to build your own optimizer, these are the kind of things you want to do. So for them, they have since they're you know, they're building software that runs on premise. It's not a cloud service. So like you're going to download Greenplum and Orca and run it on your you know your local cluster. So anytime there's a crash, or a, a, the query optimizer generates a bad query plan, it's hard for you to go how to how to go reproduce that because the you know you can't just log into the machine and start looking around and see what's going on. So they have the ability to dump out the entire state of the database, or sorry, the state of the optimizer to uh, when something bad happens and they can then ship that back to the developers at Pivotal to go put the optimizer back in the state that it was and when the crash occurred to allow them to figure out, well, what were the steps that got me to the point where I failed? All right, so this allows them to, to you know, debug these uh, problems more, more easily. And again, because the optimizer is a, is a complex beast, you, 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 you definitely need something like this. And of course, we don't do this. The, uh, the other thing they actually do is, is kind of cool, is they had this thing, they had a framework called TACO, T-A-Q-O, the testing the accuracy of the query optimizer. And basically, this was like a fuzz tester where they would generate a bunch of qu random queries, and then they would pick the, in the optimizer, the optimizer would spit out the best plan that it found, and then like the second best or the third best plan that it found. And then they would actually run both query plans in this database system and see whether the runtime of the systems matched the ordering that the optimizer thought that, that they should be ranked. So the idea is that if, if, it, if the thing that it picked as the best query plan turns out to be the worst query plan or the second best query plan and the other one turns out to be better, then they, then they know the optimizer is not, something's not right in the optimizers. It's not correctly ordering them. 
So we wanted to do this, do this in our own system. We ended up building, uh, we have, do have a framework written in Scala that can do something like this. We just don't have this hooked up into our, our nightly uh, build and test framework. And there's a bunch of traces we have from SQLite and other database uh, projects that we can then feed into this thing and see whether we're actually producing the, the correct ordering results. We just haven't done that yet. The other standalone uh, the query optimizer that actually is, I would say, this one is actually more widely used than, than Orca, is Calcite. So this was originally part of LucidDB. LucidDB was a Java-based database system uh, from the 2006, 2007. I think they were a startup and they went under. And then they, as part of like the, I guess the, the, the remnants of the project was the, this thing, Calcite. And then somebody picked it up and, and continued working on it and then made it be more, more full featured. So like Orca, this is meant to be run as a standalone service. Uh, it's meant to be a bit more extensible than Orca, meaning you can plug in different uh, data models, query, query plan types, uh, cost models, and rules. And then it just, can, it just has an optimization framework based on uh, um, cascades that will then, actually, I actually don't know if this is cascades. So I, I don't want to say that. But it's a, it's a, it runs the search, and then it can produce the, an optimal query plan back for you. Um, what's interesting about this is that unlike cascades, where, again, you have these logical versus physical operators, in Calcite, they don't make a distinction between any logical and physical. It's just always you have these operators, but then you add the annotations in. Uh, you tag, essentially, the operators to say, all right, you're a join, but here's how you're going to do the join based on this, this uh, you know, using this algorithm. So the search is all the same. I don't know how this, this changes how they do the transformation rules, but it's just they're adding these annotations in as they go rather than them having d d uh, distinct objects of the two different types. So this one's used in way more systems than Orca. Right? I don't know if Orca's even used outside of Pivotal, uh, but this thing is used in OmniSci, which is, used to be MapD. Uh, it's used in Blazing SQL, HerdDB, Apache Hive uses Calcite now. So this one is, is, is definitely becoming very popular. And I've heard, um, I think Splice Machine said they were thinking about using this, and somebody else as well. And some systems we're, we're talking about actually now, you know, in some ways in, in our, our system, we try to follow the Postgres dialect for SQL. People are talking about how now following the, the Calcite dialect for SQL, which is very cool. All right, the last one I'll talk about is MemSQL. So MemSQL is a, uh, distributed query optimizer because it's, it's a distributed uh, system and they're going to use a stratified search with a bottom-up approach um, and what's interesting about this what makes it sort of just uh, different than the other ones is that at the end of the day when they generate a physical query plan right normally in all the systems we talked about so far it says once we have the physical query plan for the optimizer we go run that what they actually do is they take the physical query plan put it back to SQL and then send that out to the different nodes in the system. So it sort of looks like this, right? So this all looks normal. Like we have a SQL query plan. Uh, we go to the parser, the binder, and then spits out a logical plan. And then we do, because uh, it's stratified search, we have a rewriter phase based on heuristics. And then they have the, the enumerator to look at different um, join orderings. But then when, the, when the, this thing spits out the physical plan, it then converts it back into SQL that it then sends to the, to, to, to the different nodes in the system. And the reason why they're doing this is that because it's a, it's a distributed database, you assume that the whatever machine the planner is running on, this, this, this piece here, that its statistics about what the data looks like on, its, on the other nodes are not going to be as accurate. So I'll figure out some high-level planning about who needs to send data from to what node to the next, or how we're going to do the join across the entire cluster? But then, when I send along SQL to these guys, to to, to the different you know the leaf nodes, they do all the steps all over again, but only for their local data because now because they have a local view of what data they're going to be processing. So therefore, they have better statistics and they make better decisions about how to optimally execute this query plan. Now, the high level constructs of like how to you know. I'm joining the table on, on this key, and I, I need to send data from this node to the next node. All that's done in the first phase of planning here. But when you land here, you know what index you use or other low-level decisions are all made locally. So as far as I know, this is this is the only system I've heard about where they take they go from SQL to physical plan to back to SQL. Everybody else basically just sends the physical plan all you know around. So this is, this is an interesting decision. 
So they wrote their uh, they wrote their optimizer in C++ and they claimed that running writing the code in C++ 11 with lambda functions made it way easier uh, than not having lambda functions. I don't know whether that, you know that's what they told me. I don't I don't know if I buy that. Okay. So this again, this is sort of a brain dump of a bunch of different optimizers out there. Calcite, I think, is the most popular one going forward, um, but it's in Java, and we want to avoid Java in our own system, so we can't use it. Okay. So one of my parting thoughts. Again, I fully admit this is the part of the data system I least understand. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the right way to 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 learn more about this if people are interested in this. So. You know, we could do a reading group in the fall based on just query optimization papers. Spend a lot of time reading stuff in the Germans, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> we could do maybe like a mini course in the fall or like a graduate level course. I, I, I need to think about this. If people are interested in this kind of stuff as much as I am, uh, then we can, we can expand on this in the fall. And again, we have our own query optimizer. We haven't, we haven't even gotten to like the, the tricky things about plan enumeration that, that I talked about. I know we're probably only looking at sort of simple, sim simplistic queries. Um, and all of this now also, as I said, this all relies on having a, a, a good cost model. Because if I can't determine whether one query plan is truly better than another through my cost model, then who cares whether I'm doing top down versus bottom up? It's all, it's all gonna be crap anyway. So all of this we need to have, make sure I have a good cost model. Now, make sure I have a good cost model, we need good statistics, because that's how we're gonna estimate how much work we're going to do from one opera to the next, and whether one, you know, one physical manifestation of a query plan is better than, than another. So that's what we're going to focus on on Wednesday, and that's the paper you guys are going to read. It's basically going to show that all cost models and all query plans are crap. They get it all wrong, uh, and they will show you what happens if you actually had perfectly uh, accurate data, how much better you can actually do. And so I'm not, well, I've already sort of spoiled it. Uh, SQL Server will be the best one in that paper. I don't think they're labeled uh, for the commercial systems. See if you, if you can guess who actually does the worst. All right, and that, that'll be the. I'll, sh I'll show you show you the guys on on Wednesday. All right. Any questions? Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it Careful with the bottle, baby, you can still spill it Cause ain't eyes and said, the pain eyes red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds They gon' get you some same knives and drink it to the studs Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of St. Ives